A few weeks ago, I had some children come to me. You can probably imagine which ones. There's about six of them that run around here constantly. And they came over to me and they were like, hey, we want to challenge you. So I'm naming today's message the challenge because they challenged me. And as they were challenging me, Miss Barb was there and they said, wait, 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 Miss Barb too, we're challenging both of you. I do want you to know we would have not gotten through it. We would not we would have not gotten through it if we hadn't both been challenged, because both of us kind of messed up here and there. <laughs> but they challenged us because they wanted to know if we would take the challenge of learning the armor of God as it's found in Ephesians chapter six. The armor of God. So, of course, Barb and I took that challenge. But I kind of turned it around on the children. I said, I'll take that challenge and I'll learn the, the armor of God, but you have to help me preach the message. Well, you know, I, I don't have to tell you who Caleb would say, <laughs> yes, I'm there. Uh, but but uh, a couple of them were like, in front of everybody, you know? So I asked them to come and share the scripture with us in a little bit different way. If you'd like to follow along, they're going to be reading, they're going to be talking, they're going to be talking about Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18. Okay? I see them kind of assembled back there, and I'm hoping that means they're coming this way, because I'm stalling very much. <laughs> Uh, I can sing a song. It's good. It's good. So we're talking about the armor of God, and we're talking about it as it's seen in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. Let me have the children come and share with you now about that passage. Thank 
out of this passage. <clears throat> and that led me to wonder what the Apostle Paul was actually talking about. What was the Apostle Paul actually warning his friends in Ephesus about? So I started to investigate Pastor Ed Stott. Pastor Ed Stott is a little different than most investigations. I know that, you know that. So I started to kind of look at that. And it seems to me like Paul is concerned that the people may fall into a trap. So he's talking to people, wait, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to followers of the way. People who knew Jesus. Maybe some of them knew him and walked with him. But probably most of these people did not know Jesus personally. And that's who he's talking to when he starts talking to them about the armor. And he seems to be warning them that they need to be aware of what's going on around them. Have you ever felt like you needed to know what was going on around you? Like maybe you were a little bit out of touch with what's actually happening in the world? <clears throat> I, I don't know if anybody even saw this. I was talking to my mother this past week on the phone. And I have not seen one head, headline about this thing, except for when I went online and searched for it. But in Hoboken, New Jersey, which is a place where Barb and I took teenagers many, many, many times. We would go to New York City or out on to Long Island and do some mission work. And then we would go to, we didn't really go to Hoboken, but Hoboken and Secaucus are real close to each other. And so we would go through Hoboken to get to the Secaucus where we would stay for the last night. If you ever go on a mission trip with me, I usually try to make the last night really fun. We would stay at an embassy suites. That's half of what they what they uh, raised to go on the trip almost. Not really, but uh, we'd go to an embassy suites. They'd get a really good meal. We'd go out and see some some of the town a little bit. And uh, but Hoboken, there was a train coming from the city over to Hoboken Station that did not slow down at all. Went straight into the station, jumped the track, hit somebody standing on the side, killed them, obviously. Over 100 people seriously injured. And I never saw a headline. Yeah, it was. Do you ever realize that there's things that are going on around us that we don't know about? Well, it feels like that's what Paul's saying to the people in, in, in Ephesians. He's saying, look, there's things going on that you don't even know about. You don't even realize, and you have to be aware. That's kind of what I got out of that. And and he was saying the apostle the apostles actually warning the people that they need to be they need to be praying. They need to be praying because they can't be confused. You ever think about that? Do you ever get confused about what's happening? I have found that as I get older, confusion comes easier. <laughs> when I was younger, I didn't believe I was confused. I probably was, but I just didn't believe it. Now I'm getting a little older, I'm realizing that I really don't know everything. Just wait. Which was all good until my kids realized I didn't know everything. Yeah, there you go. Just wait. Right? So you don't want to be confused. And there is this one we call the evil one, the devil. The, the one that we are standing against. He is trying to confuse us more. In the scripture, he calls it the devil's schemes. Right? The devil's schemes. They're, he's trying to confuse us. The devil's schemes are things that cause us to kind of face trouble as we try to follow Christ. You think about that? The, the things that happen around us, in our communities, in, in our friends, in our families, sometimes they'll try to confuse us. And I don't think any of our friends or family really do this on purpose. But they get kind of twisted in our mind. And once they're twisted, we start to wonder, um, what is that about? Where does that come from? These schemes bring into question things about the spiritual realm. Things that are going on. And they open us to attacks that could knock us off the path of righteousness. Right? 
they could knock us off. They could make us start thinking. I shared with you about my friends uh, that that uh, have have been some of them in school to become pastors, who are now considering themselves to be sort of atheists. They won't go as far. Some of them will go as far as saying I am an atheist. Most of them do not. Most of them are like I just don't really. Care. I don't know. And why is that? It's because the devil's schemes have confused them. And they have tried to figure it out in their own time, in their own way, in their own being. Every time, I want to tell you something. Every time you try to figure God out from this thing, you're going to mix it up. God's way bigger than us. Amen. He's way more than we can understand. But we are to continually try to grow and become more like Him. So as we learn more, we apply it to our lives and we become more like the image of Christ. Or we can hold up our hands and say, that's it, I'm done, I'm not going any further, right? And when we do that, we stop. What's the first thing that happens when water stops running? It starts to get stagnant. And soon it starts to stink. I don't want to go that far with you guys. I hope you never start to stink. Okay? Okay. So, we have to know what's going on around us because we have to find ways to protect ourselves from it. God bless you. That's where the armor comes in. We have to find ways to apply truths that we know that will keep our faith strong. The That's right. We have to find those ways. So we have to continuously cover ourselves with things that will help us live as Christ has asked us to live. Continuously. We have to keep that happening. We can't stop. That's why I think really, you know, I, I understand and I think the kids did a great job. The belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the, the shield, the sword, the head, the helmet, all of those things are very important. But you know what the most important piece of armor is? Prayer. The most important piece of armor is prayer. It's not even one of the physical things that they put on. But Paul goes into that, and I'm going to go there in just a few minutes. We find our strength to stand against the devil's schemes in our prayer life. And so I want to spend some time thinking about prayer. Thinking about how prayer affects us. How prayer changes us. How prayer challenges us. As we pray every day, we can think of ways that we're attacked. Can't we? Every time you stop and pray, don't you feel like there's something, isn't that when things come to your mind that you need to remember? You need to pray more about? It sparks a thought to spiritually and mentally put on a protective cover that will keep us strong in the Lord. Or at least it should. And the Apostle Paul understood this and he used a Roman soldier's cover, a Roman soldier's armor to help us understand <coughs> all of that, how that works. So let's take a few minutes and look at how these things work together. We have the belt of truth, right? As we pray, we want to be sure that we're not doing all of the talking. Okay, I don't want anybody to raise your hand, but I want you to get real with yourself right now. When you take time to pray, how often, I'm going to use a bad word, how often do you shut up? Right? I mean, right? I mean, think about it. I, when I pray, I'm like, okay, God, Lord, I pray that you would bless this person. I pray that you would help this person. God, will you do this for me? God, will you help this? God, 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 God. When do I stop? When do I listen? Prayer's conversation. Prayer's not one-sided. And so, as we pray, we have to be sure that we're not doing all of the talking. So then, as we pray, let's find a way to stop and settle so that we can hear God speak to us. 
You've had the opportunity to hear Pat McHenry speak. I know he's been in the pulpit a few times for me. And I, I'm pretty close to Pat. We talk a lot. Um, I feel very safe saying, because I know how open he is, because I usually listen to what he's spoken from up here. I know how open he is about his prayer life and how God speaks to him. That's one of the reasons why I'm willing to let him preach from this pulpit. Because I know that he listens to God. Every, almost every morning, Barb and I read our scriptures together and pray together. And Barb and I share often during that time about how God is speaking to her. She shares that with me. I don't tell her what that's about. I learned a long time about that. Uh, but she shares with me how God's speaking to her. Many of you have, talk, have talked to me and told me about how God is, is directing your life or how He's speaking to you about something. I can tell you for sure that God speaks to me continuously. And it's because I spend time listening to Him. So I know that God speaks. And I know that a lot of you know that God speaks. <coughs> so the belt of truth the belt of truth is put on through prayer. And it's listening as well as speaking. And so as we consider what God's saying to us, we put that on figuratively. He speaks, we le he leads. Right? He speaks, he leads. We listen, we follow. He speaks, he leads. We listen, we receive, we follow. And if we're truly listening and we're truly following, then we're walking in His truth. Do you get that? If you're not listening, you don't know if you're walking in His truth. You need to know. And you can know. So, listen as well as speak. Truth is found through Scripture. Truth is found through a holy walk with Christ. Truth is found through obedience. That's what you do when you hear. You are obedient and follow. Truth is found through us slowing down and receiving what God has for us. So, take the time to pray with an open heart. Open heart, receiving, willing to hear truth from God and do it continuously. That's scriptural. That's scriptural all the way. The next one is the breastplate of righteousness. And as we think about righteousness in the, in the armor, we think of a breastplate. We think of uh, this, this thing that covers the essential organs of our body. <coughs> we realize that it keeps us safe when something tries to pierce or cut us down. That's the breastplate. And righteousness is our act of living according to God's love and truth. That's righteousness. If we're praying, which means talking and listening, right? And we're receiving, and so we're following. Then, righteousness is our act of living according to God's truth. See how those work together? You need the belt of truth so that you can live a righteous life. Then righteousness covers and protects us. And it keeps us true. Anybody here have a family crest that you know of? Know what a family crest is? Good. So a family crest. A family crest is usually some kind of a shield or some kind of arms weaponry that's, that's drawn up and it's, it's received and, and agreed on that this is going to be our symbol as a family. <clears throat> it's meant to keep the family together. It's meant as a symbol that says, I am part of this family. I am a part of 
what is happening with the Lianza. So I was going to put our Lianza crest up here, but and it, it was it was more hassle than it was worth. I tried a couple times, it just didn't work out. And this crest, it sets the person wearing it aside as someone who matters to the family. You're a family member, you matter. Now, I realize all of you are not from the same kind of family I'm from. But I can tell you that family makes a difference for us. And so for us, you know, you know the old saying, my dad used to say this all the time. He he tear us up because we deserved it. Yeah, we deserved everyone. He'd tear us up and then he'd say, Now, don't you ever let somebody else put down your brother. Don't you ever let somebody get into your family business. Now, I don't always agree with that, but what I learned was, you don't mess with my brothers. You don't mess with my kids. If you do, even if you take me out, I'm going to be the first one to go because I'm stepping in there. Family matters. And that's what I learned from that. The family crest says, you are part of the family. The breastplate of righteousness is also a symbol. It says, I am a member of God's family. You can take it as your crest. Because it says, I have become all I should be for Jesus, and he has received me into the family. I am no longer an outsider. I am not even adopted. I am knitted in. I am a part of God's family. I have put on all Jesus has for me, and He has made me righteous. It's a decision to be a part of the family of God. Just like it's a decision to be a part of your family. Or mine. We decide whether we're going to stay in the family or we're going to walk away. It's a decision whether you want to be a part of God's family. And this means that I'm chosen to become righteous as I walk through life. I'm chosen by God to become a part of the family and walk a righteous life. If I choose. He's already made the way. Now it's my choice. Then, once I say yes, what does he do? He fills me with the Holy Spirit and He leads me in the path of righteousness. I bet if I were to go around this room and have everybody quoted, almost every one of you could quote the 23rd Psalm. You know why? Because even before I knew Jesus, people were telling me the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm, part of it says, He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. Right? He does the work. Even after we say yes. Even after he draws us to himself and we receive his love, then he's still doing more work in us. He draws us and takes us on the path of righteousness. So we become righteous because we begin to live in a constant state of prayer. There comes prayer again. You want to have a breastplate of righteousness? You want to be a part of the family of God? You want to understand all of that? Then you need to pray. It's a big part of it. As we walk in union with Jesus, we engage in conversation with Him. As He speaks to us, he speaks His love into us. It's His love that changes everything. Do you know that? The way we see life, the way we treat others, the way we accept who we are, all of that comes as we walk and talk with Jesus. All of it. Then comes the shoes of the gospel of peace. Now here you have a thought about peace changing things. You ever thought about how peace affects you? 
Some of you are like so stressed out, you don't even know what peace looks like. <laughs> well, here's how I want you to realize what peace is. You know that really stressed out, out of control, like I can't figure anything out anymore? You know that feeling? Most of us know that feeling. Okay, exactly opposite of that, that's what we're talking about today. Okay, exactly opposite of that. We're talking about peace. Peace is, um, peace is something that we can never attain on our own. Do you know that? I mean, ask anybody who has tried to gain all the wealth of the world. You can get really rich and not have peace. Remember the rich young ruler we just talked about a few weeks ago? The guy that came to Christ and said, okay, so what do you want me to do? And he said, well, you know, this, 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 this. Oh, I do all those things. Well, go sell everything you have and follow me. Oh. Right? Right? We all have that place where there's something that gets in the way of us receiving the peace that we're given. If we wear the shoes of the gospel of peace, that means more than just receiving peace. It means that we then take that peace into our relationships. We then take that peace into our world, our communities, our workplace. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor. You don't have any idea what it's like in my workplace. Peace is not really something that's well there. We're like working to get ahead. Everybody's trying to get their own thing. Peace is not really part of it. I've had lots of conversations with lots of you. And you've talked to me about things like how it is when you're trying to bring Jesus into a conversation. But Jesus doesn't always bring peace into a conversation, does he? Sometimes he brings confrontation into a conversation. But it's this peace. And we used to talk about it all the time back in the old church. Uh, I guess I'm really getting older. But the peace that passes understanding. The peace that passes understanding. The peace that we can't really explain. The peace that's there when everything's kind of crazy in my life. Yet there's something inside of me that I'm holding on to that still knows that I know that I know. <laughs> you guys following me? These are all Christian words that I do my very best never to use. Right? Because they're, they're words that don't really... They don't really connect unless you understand what things were like 20 or 30 years ago. Right? So like, peace. Peace is not something we just decide to have. But peace, if we're praying, becomes a part of us. Peace becomes the thing that we hold on to. Because when the peace gets mixed up, we're way off kilter, right? We can handle stress as long as we have the peace of God. <coughs> we can handle problems as long as we have the peace of God. We can handle mental breakdowns and, and problems that are coming at us constantly and all the fiery darts, right? I think that was, uh, uh, not Benny. Um, <coughs> Brandon, thank you. Brandon. I think it was Brandon that said, the fiery darts. He had the shield and it takes out the fiery darts of the wicked. That's right. The fiery darts. We can handle those if we have the peace. We have to have that peace that passes more understanding than we can explain. And it only comes through prayer and time with God. I want to take the next three and look at them together. Because they fit really well as we look at the offensive side of Christ's followers. There's the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. When you think of how the people in Jesus' day fought, you can relate to the, the need for an offensive battle here. Right? Hand-to-hand -hand combat. Imagine going out onto the war field 
with all the people with their swords and shields and helmets and they're ready to go and you have on shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> right? So you've got to have some offensive kind of gear. I tend to think of things like King Arthur and the Knights of the Rock Round Table. I was into that whole medieval thought. I liked it a lot. And so like that's why I still like movies like The Lord of the Rings. You know, it means it means a lot. It connects to me. Because I like that. But I don't necessarily love all the gore. I just like what it stands for. I say that knowing that the next thing I'm going to say is going to say, uh, yeah, right, you don't like the gore. One of my favorite movies of all time is 300. And if you've ever watched 300, there's a lot of blood in 300. But if you've ever watched 300, you understand it's the Spartans. 300 men standing up to thousands upon thousands upon thousands coming at them. And that's really what the movie's all about. This small group of men who are full of courage and they know they're going to die. None of them think they're going to live through the day. And yet, they take out a whole bunch of people. Why? Because they're standing for something they believe in. Here's my point. We've been given armor to help us stand strong. Some of that armor is meant to protect our bodies. And some of it gives us strength to fight. Meaning, we have an offensive ability as well. Now, hear that. Offensive. Think football and playing offense. Don't think offensive like it doesn't matter if I hurt all your feelings. Offensive is not the same thing as what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we have the ability to take the offense sometimes. We have a shield and we can use we can use it to both turn away the enemy's weapons and to charge into battle. It's both a protective and an offensive weapon. We have a helmet to protect our head and to duck and plant and to lift our enemy as we throw them over our bodies. I almost showed a video, but I couldn't find one that was not like gory on 300. But there's a lot of that where like, you know, you're being charged, think football again. You're being charged, somebody's coming to tackle me. I lower my shoulder and I lift, right? To get it past them. That's what the helmet helped do. And we have the sword. The sword is by far the greatest of the given held weapons. By far. Because with the sword, we can slay those who oppose God. Am I right? Amen. What's the sword? The word, of the, Lord. the word of God, right? The Bible. The scriptures. The sword. Think about how we use the word of God. Don't we share it in ways that helps others see God's truth? Don't we share it in ways that helps others see God's love? Don't we share it in ways that helps others see God's desire for them to know Him? I hope so. Because it's a weapon of love. It's a weapon of love. Not a weapon of war. And we use each of these pieces of armor correctly through our relationship with God. Every one of these things happens because of prayer. So let me end the sermon today with one more important thought. Every one of these pieces happens as we pray. Right? Because of what it said in verse, 13, verse 18. Of Ephesians 6. And pray in the Spirit on all occasion with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. It's prayer that makes the armor, armor work. It's prayer that makes the armor important. It's prayer that makes the armor our protection. 
So we have to pray. Where are you on this idea of prayer today? Are you living as one who walks and talks with Jesus constantly? Have you come to a place in your faith where you can't imagine a day without conversation with Jesus? Or do you go to bed at night thinking, oh, that's right, I didn't pray today. I didn't talk today. I didn't hear God today. Is your prayer life changing who you are? Does it challenge you to be different? Are you willing to become the man or woman that God is asking you to be? As you know, these altars are always here for you to pray. Obviously, we're talking about prayer. If you'd like to come, while the band's coming to lead us, don't let the darts of doubt 